Welcome back to EV News Daily. Coming up today, the EV fire at Luton Airport was all lies. The Cybertruck wireless charging and the UK's third battery gigafactory. Plus, stay tuned because later in the show, I'll tell you what Stellantis is saying about making those cheap Chinese cars in Europe. Well, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's EV News Daily, your trusted source of EV information. First day of the week, Monday, 25th of March. Today, I'm Martin Lee and I go through every EV story so you don't have to. I'm here to save you time and we go live at 5 p.m. UK. Our Patreon supporters get the episodes as soon as they're ready, though, first and ad-free. Be like them by clicking on a link in the show notes. Let's start with a few things that came in over the weekend, things that people tagged me on on social media and things like that. The first one was a Renault 5 spotted in France, and this was a, a French user on X going by the name Stéphanie LBB, uh, who wrote, uh, Par chez moi, à l'instant, so, uh, you know, near my near my house um, or outside my house right now is a picture of the Renault 5 and it's got a little bit of camo on the rear screen on the rear windows uh, maybe to stop people uh, looking in and some on the back window as well but taking a look at these pictures in a bright yellow color by the way for my audio listeners uh, the Renault 5 just you know not in a kind of unveiling video uh, but just seen on the streets looks proper it looks really good proper retro but uh the the high gloss on the wheel arches the little bits of red sporty trim around the top of the windows and the uh you know the very kind of retro front end square lights i think look fantastic so i really can't wait for this Renault 5 to arrive also got tagged in a couple of things from friday's podcast the tesla v4 superchargers that are now opening up under third party names we think the here in the uk we were the first ones to get them at the end of last week. More photos of the first EV point Tesla V4s showing up, this time via LinkedIn. Uh, a user, Dan Munford is his name, and he posted some pictures that EG Group had sent him. And I'll put this on screen for our YouTube viewers of this podcast. Um, he's taken one of the shots. It's a really interesting reminder that the V4 layout, whenever you build V4s, whether that is Tesla or by the looks of it, third-party solutions. Maybe this is even mandated by Tesla. I wouldn't be surprised if they say, hey, you have to have the layout like this. You have the V4 dispenser, the hardware itself, uh, exactly in the middle of the charging space. And obviously, you know, the V2s, V3s are off to the side because that's where the cables are. And they were never designed to, to charge non-Teslas, whereas these are. And so you look at the layout of the, uh, of the site and it reflects what the pure v4 sites the tesla v4 sites are so i thought, I thought that was just interesting as, as an aside and um uh, and it's the same layout so i wouldn't be surprised if that's all part of buying these from tesla but well done to um eg group for putting these outside their asda store their asda express store and there was a close-up of the screen on the v4 as well uh, just above where you tap the uh, your credit card, your charge card to start a charge if you don't use the Tesla app. And there's not much on it, actually. Very clean, very simple. Uh, it says the state of charge at the top in percentage with a progress bar. It says how much you've spent so far. Uh, then it says the current charging rate. Then in a smaller font, it says the total dispensed energy and how long you've been charging as well. I think it looks really, really cool. And fresh from the first pictures coming out, uh, this was uh, in Utoxita, these first V4 for third-party ones. Uh, there is now some pictures online that I got tagged in. Thank you very much for my listeners and viewers that did this. Uh, Tesla Owners UK X account had some pictures of the new V4 uh, chargers going in. Same branding, so EG Group, the EV Point branding going in just off the M1 Junction 39. So I think that would be the M1 uh, between Sheffield and Leeds. That would be the Moto site, the Moto Services, uh, where there is already some uh, Tesla superchargers, aren't there? I might be wrong on that, but either way, they're pretty well served on the M1 uh, around that area. Uh, but it looks Again, the, the, the site has the hardware delivered at the moment. It's on crates, it's on pallets, so nothing's going into the ground just yet. But uh, Tesla Owners UK saying eight new Tesla V4, uh, V4 EV Point branded chargers going in just off the M1 Junction 39. And you can see the uh, the, the Tesla hardware in the background, uh, but the actual dispensers having that EV Point branding on. And finally, thank you to those that tagged me in this post from the X account Rivian Tracker. And this is a picture of 
of a, uh, a very bright purple Rivian charging on a V4 supercharger in the US, in Oregon, actually, uh, taking 217 kilowatts of power at 44% state of charge. But one of the pictures just shows the benefits of having the longer cables on the V4s. And it just means that there's just no problems with using a, a, a non-Tesla vehicle at those sites. Interestingly, not sure whether this is the end of an aisle or whether it's a different design, but this one doesn't have the V4 dispenser absolutely in the middle of the parking space from this from the shot that we've that we've got on screen right now um, so that could be a different layout design we'll keep an eye on that and uh, the other picture shows uh, that Rivian have integrated the charging really nice now that uh, you know Rivian has plug and charge enabled on the Tesla network even if you haven't got your adapter yet they're getting ready for that and it shows on screen the not only the charge speed that you've got the total kilowatt hours and the time it's going to end in, but also the rolling or the running charge. And this one's just showing $3.99. Uh, but it's the, you know, the cumulative cost in dollars and cents, which again, I think is just very, very cool. A great implementation. Well done, Rivian. Well done, Tesla for working together. Let's get into the news then. And this story came out over the weekend and I eagerly await the thousands of media articles today saying, oh, we were wrong. Sorry about that. The Luton Airport parking fire has been ruled accidental. Now, if you weren't aware of this story, maybe you're not either in this country or just passed you by. It was a fire that consumed over 1,400 cars at uh, Luton Airport, which is outside of London. Uh, they still call it uh, London Luton Airport. It's a long way from London, by the way. Uh, but it was determined to be accidental, according to a joint investigation by the Fire and Police Services today. An electrical fault or a component in a moving diesel vehicle was the cause of the accident. At the peak of the emergency, over 100 firefighters were deployed to manage the fire. Uh, it resulted in aircraft being grounded uh, for uh, several hours, even a day, I think it was. The initial fire spread from the fault in one vehicle, to others nearby, despite attempts by the vehicle's owner to extinguish the flames. So, what is the problem with this? Well, it is that all of the media coverage at the time blamed an electric car. Here is some coverage from October 2023 that my YouTube viewers can see from Yahoo News. Luton Airport fire. What caused it? Was it an electric car? Is the question in the headline. I'll tell you the answer. No, it wasn't. But this is just one of the articles and that kind of summed up exactly what happened in the media coverage at the time. Uh, they talk about the uh, the fire, and then very quickly, he says, as the incident unfolded, it was unclear what started the fire. However, users on the social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, started to speculate it was caused by an electric car. And it didn't take long for pretty much all of the media articles that I was reading uh, last October to start saying, oh, EV fire destroys 1,400 cars at Luton Airport. There were some good reporters on this. There was some BBC coverage at the time saying uh, that early reports say it was a uh, it was a diesel hybrid vehicle. It was probably the lithium-ion battery in a diesel hybrid Range Rover. No, no such thing, right? It was a diesel vehicle that caused it. The drive was in the car. They managed to get it into a space, is evacuate the vehicle, and I'm glad they were safe. Uh, but it was nothing to do with an electric car. It wasn't caused by an EV, and the frantic media coverage at the time, blaming EVs, uh, which was... I mean, pretty quickly debunked because the kind of people that I follow on my social media platforms are the kind of more level-headed people who would go, well, hang on, the, you've actually just shown a screenshot of it's a Range Rover, so it can't be an EV. Questioned it, but the headlines and the text often didn't match what was being reported. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to all of those outlets saying today, oh, hey, by the way, no, it wasn't. It was a diesel car. It, was, it wasn't. It was a diesel car. <laughs> I think I'll be waiting a long time. Now let's talk Cybertruck and inductive charging. Now, this is a story that kind of developed after we hit publish on Friday's podcast at the end of last week. I got tagged in a couple of posts on X, which was... The first couple of Cybertruck teardowns are here, uh, happening right now. They're up on the ramp and the, uh, people are having a look at them. Um, and there's a couple of those happening. One of them found a couple of orange connectors underneath the vehicle and they're not being used. They're vacant right now. And lots of speculation ensued. And a couple of those people that I follow on, uh, on social media who know a lot about 
batteries and these kind of things and engineering. So that, that could well be for inductive charging, you know. And so I, I took it with a slight grain of salt until we get more uh, confirmation. But I was very excited by that because I have an, an irrational uh, fascination with inductive charging. It's no use to me at all because it takes all of three seconds to take the plug off my wall and plug my car in. <laughs> no point. But I'm I'm just convinced in the back of my deep, dark brain recesses. It's got to be useful somewhere, either for those who are disabled or taxis or robotax or something. Anyway, uh, and then later in the day on, uh, on, on Friday, people bothered to actually look at the manual for the Cybertruck online because, you know, who reads the manual for anything? And it clearly says the release connectors at 2x4 headers for the AC compressor and inductive charging headers. Uh, they are the orange, you know, if you look inside, uh, underneath your bonnet of an EV, you see lots of orange cables. That's the high voltage stuff. They're that color. And so it was clearly not just the low voltage part of the car, uh, but the actual manual says inductive charger headers. And then I think a couple of the uh, members of the team, maybe even Franz, the designer, uh, replied and said, hey, it's amazing what you can find in the manual. Uh, and so it was there, uh, hiding in uh, broad daylight for all of us to see. Uh, but it took someone to actually tear the truck apart and then look at the manual. So that's interesting because we've seen some pictures before from Tesla's publicity material with an inductive charging pad underneath. It was a Model 3, I think. It was a long time ago. And they they did buy a wireless charging company. Um, I think they then sold it sometime later and kept some of the staff or all of the engineering staff, maybe. So um, they're, they're very quiet on inductive charging. If anything, they've been anti it in, in the past, but they've also been anti vehicle to grid or vehicle to load. And you know now the Cybertruck has that. So you can't really judge Tesla by what they said in years gone by. And so we'll wait and see what happens with it. Uh, but again, I just think that's such a cool development. I don't think it's useful for most of us, but it's just cool. However, of some concern, less cool news, uh, that would be the Q1 delivery numbers for Tesla. Now, this isn't a Tesla financial podcast, and I never pretend to know uh, anything than my tiny brain understands about such things. But as a bellwether of the EV industry, I try to keep a close eye on what's happening with uh, with Tesla, production, deliveries. And, and so I try and always listen to the earnings calls of at least the big car makers as well. And this is an interesting sign. Tesla scaling back production of their Shanghai Gigafactory because of a slowdown in growth in their EV sales there. And also remember that Gigafactory is a big export hub as well, reducing the work schedule for employees manufacturing Model 3 and Model Y to five days a week from six and a half days a week. Despite the reduction in work days, the two daily shifts will operate still for 11.5 hours each. Certain sections of the Shanghai plant, like the battery production lines, are also having extended downtime. Tesla's Shanghai facility has an annual production rate of around 950,000 vehicles. It's the largest manufacturing site in a big export hub, like I say. And you look at the uh, monthly numbers. You always need to look at it quarterly, because uh, depending on whether they're selling in China that month and it spikes, or whether they're exporting and it dips down and everyone freaks out because China sales have gone down, but it was actually just for export. Still, when you look at the overall number, which we'll find out very soon, we see the state of health for not just Tesla, but EV really EV sales as, as I mentioned, that bellwether of the EV industry uh, to see how well they're doing or not. And I think there is some consternation, at least, from people who worry about such matters, the investors and things like that, uh, that what analysts, the consensus was maybe around 485 or 490,000 vehicles this quarter uh, could be significantly under that. So we'll keep an eye on that. And a great bit of news coming out of the UK today. The third largest, uh, third large battery factory here uh, is on its way. Will be, will be the largest when it opens, though. Eve Energy, the leading Chinese manufacturer of cylindrical EV batteries, is in advanced talks, they say, to establish a 60 gigawatt hour production facility in the Midlands, Coventry. If you know the, uh, the geography of this country, the expansion dependent on financial incentives from the UK government aren't, isn't it always, though, not just here, but uh, 
companies always want to hunt out those subsidies, don't they? Uh, drawn from a £4.5 billion support fund, uh, initially a 20 gigawatt hour plant will be built, £1.2 billion UK pounds to build that, and the scale to triple to 60 gigawatt hours in time. The Times newspaper reporting that Eve Energy has secured an agreement with an unnamed car manufacturer for these cylindrical cells. Eve's gigafactory will be bigger than Nissan's Sunderland plant. Of course, uh, that's been there a long time through various different ownerships and uh, making it uh, the UK's largest gigafactory uh, uh, battery factory. Tata Group is committed to spending £4 billion on their EV battery in su- uh, factory in Somerset, which is only about an hour that way of me, uh, aiming to generate 4,000 jobs there. Well, the West Midlands is a bit of a hub for the automotive space uh, and also kind of uh, sort of engineering in general for automotive and motor racing and things like that. Automotive wise, got Jaguar Land Rover, obviously, Aston Martin. Uh, BMW and more names as well. The UK Battery Industrialization Centre is their battery research facility in the area that the government are really trying to push the UK forward on. Eve Energy has partnerships with Daimler Trucks in the US. They have an alliance with Rimats in Croatia, who these days, of course, are Volkswagen Group's battery tech leads. Uh, StoreDot as well, uh, an Eve client. Uh, yeah, they're ultra fast or Fast Charging Battery Technology, XFC, then they call it, uh, the battery technology being made by Eve Energy. So we'll wait and see why the Chinese want this site so badly. And hopefully, you know, it's not a done deal. It's advanced talks, but we'll watch that uh, very carefully. And some very exciting news for the industry here. All right, next up, another story that came in, or at least was was developing on Friday as I was writing the podcast on Friday and only really got confirmed, and I can understand it after we published, and that is Stellantis reducing their workforce, cutting around 400 white-collar jobs in the United States, focusing on roles related to engineering, tech, and software at their Michigan headquarters. I started getting tagged in posts from listeners and viewers of the podcast uh, that had been told on the previous day to work from home on Friday, an ominous sign when everybody in the office is told, do not come in tomorrow, we will provide an update and tell you why. Yeah, it doesn't sound good, does it? The layoffs are a strategic move to restructure resources in alignment with their transition to EVs. The company emphasising the necessity of this decision to maintain competitiveness. The CEO, Carlos Tavares, highlighting the cost challenges, saying that EVs are 40% more expensive to make than traditional combustion cars. For the average consumer, it's a cost they have to pass on right now. And Stellantis has announced the launch of 18 new EVs globally. I think eight of those, seven or eight, are going to be in North America. So a big expansion. Um, in a market that they're not really uh, selling many EVs in at the moment, if at all. Despite the workforce reduction, Stellantis still had a net profit of $7.7 billion in the latter half of last year. So they're, they're doing okay, but they're watching uh, the pennies closely by the look of it. Look, Ford and GM have done the same, either with early retirement or optional redundancies and things like that. So Stellantis not alone in this. Their statement directly linked these job cuts to electric vehicles. Whilst we understand this is difficult news, they say in their quote, these actions will better align resources while preserving the critical skills to protect our competitive advantage as we remain laser focused on implementing our EV product offensive. So uh, that news, bad news, obviously, for those people affected, directly linked to the move to electric vehicles. Staying with Stellantis, but this side of the pond now. And one of those stories, again, that uh, fascinates me because I don't think I'm, I've am i been able to think through all of the implications just yet, apart from knowing that it's, I think, a really big deal, but I can't read the tea leaves just yet. And that is Stellantis's investment in Leap Motor, the Chinese EV manufacturer, and taking that investment in order to secure exclusive rights to build those cheaper Chinese cars and sell them in Western markets. Leap Motor, the Chinese EV maker, is going to start building their vehicles in Europe at the Stellantis facility in Poland, according to news breaking over the weekends. The production of the T03 from Leap Motor is a compact EV. will start before the end of June using the semi-knockdown method, so partial assembly kits to be fully assembled at the site. Uh, the plant was chosen for their ability to maintain the low production cost, which is where all of those cheap Chinese cars, apart from the direct incentives uh, they get, it's just such lower costs to make the vehicles in 
China. The T03 has about 174 miles of range. That's 280 kilometers currently being imported into European markets like France, costing 20,000 euros. That 21% share in Leap Motor that Stellantis took for $1.6 billion does mean that this joint venture uh, gives Stellantis the exclusive rights to manufacture, export and sell those Chinese cars in Western markets. Now, the Polish plant responsible for making uh, the Fiat 500, 600, Jeep Avenger already. And I think this is just the first move that we will see as regulators all around the world, outside China, look to see how can we perhaps put tariffs on those Chinese cars coming in. And the reply from the car maker saying, well, okay, well, we'll, we'll make some investments, but we're building those cars. They're not Chinese cars. Are they licensed? What's the get around? Again, I I haven't fully thought I thought thought it through. I don't have the probably the ex- skills, experience, and knowledge to do that. I'm just an enthusiast of the industry, uh, but I sense it's a really big deal. And by far from the only time this is going to be done, especially if Stellantis make a go of it. Um, well, I think we'll see many more of these types of deals. Well, interestingly, the head of Mercedes talking uh, about those Chinese imports recently saying we shouldn't put tariffs on those cars. Let the market decide. Fair play and uh, fair market for everyone and we'll compete. Well, uh, they do sell to a certain segment of the audience. And then the Maybach cars sell to an even smaller segment of that. The Mercedes Maybach EQS. So that's the SUV version of the EQS. The SUV 680 is now on sale. And it's not for the likes of all of us, I must admit. Uh, So, and that's before you even start looking at the options list. But either way, uh, the Maybach version of the Mercedes EQS SUV, uh, not only I think looks fantastic in its fancy pants, two-tone colours and all the wonderful interior that it's going to have but the engineering it's similar it's 107.8 kilowatt hour battery so still 380 miles or 612 kilometers of range but they've boosted the output uh, to 484 kilowatts that's another 84 kilowatts of power but you start at that 50,000 euro premium for that. Oh, you do get 22 kilowatt AC charging as standard, not on the options list. Uh, You do get the option of a first class rear package, executive rear seats. Uh, You can tick the night series edition for 30,000 euros, but then you've got to have the first class rear package. That's 20,000. So you've added already another 50 grand on. So it's 250 before you really hit the options list. So uh, let's have some fun and look at this vehicle, realizing well, <laughs> most of us will never drive anything like this. I'm not sure I'd want to have a car worth as you know as much as some houses, but uh, still really interesting. At the very top end of EVs, uh, they are developing stuff like this, and it, 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 it looks very, very nice. Let's talk about companies doing the right thing. We love that when it happens. It doesn't always happen. But Chevy's launch of the Blazer EV has not been without significant software issues. There was even a stop sale on the vehicle. Following the resolution of those issues, Chevy had to reduce the price of the Blazer EV up to $6,500 on certain models uh, to convince people, hey, have another look at this vehicle. We've sorted it out. Well, early Blazer EV purchases before March the 7th are now being offered reimbursements by the car maker in order to effectively lower the price they paid, which matches the new MSRP. The reimbursement amount uh, varies with the Blazer RS all-wheel drive, $5,500 back from the original 60 K, uh, the Blazer LT base trim, uh, they get six and a half back, dropping the price effectively to fifty one nine five from its fifty six and a half thousand purchase price. And so you could say that those buyers were just unlucky uh, because prices go move all the time. Tesla changed their prices all the time. Dealers are always changing their prices. That's the nature of buying a car, which by some people. People prefer to do the direct thing and some others don't. Uh, But this move, addressing that overpayment by the early adopters, making sure they do the right thing by those people. Look, this is a rounding error. It's money down the back of the sofa for these huge car companies, but it goes a long way to goodwill and just doing the right thing. So why don't Chevrolet?
What a bit of news that I missed last week from BMW's event, and that was a nice little round number that came out. BMW celebrating the sale of its two millionth EV. Well, plug-in hybrids are included on this, everything from the X1, xDrive, 25e, uh, all the way through to the i7 and everything they make, the iX that is... Pure Electric, the CEO, Oliver Zipser, uh, announcing the landmark achievements, highlighting the significant growth in BMW's EV sales. Last year was a 74% increase in EV deliveries, well, let's say plug-in deliveries compared to the previous year. The proportion of EVs in BMW's so, uh, total sales climbed from 9% to 15% last year, aiming to sell 10 million EVs by 2030, a tenfold increase from their current production, focusing on the noise Classer platform. The uh, company plans to commence the production of at least six EV models in Spartanburg by 2030 as part of their strategy to increase EV offerings. And thank you to everyone who corrected my German on Friday show, where I called it the Neue Class platform. And they said, no, nah, no, nah, you say, uh, <laughs> my German listeners, you say Porsche correctly. So just do that. Just say Neue Klasse, not class. Okay, I'm sorry for any unintended offense on the Neue Klasse platform, uh, which is going to be uh, their next greatest technology. But hey, well done to BMW for sticking 2 million plugs on the side of their vehicles. We're staying with the company, but this time their mini bit of the business. And don't you just love the Chinese ministry when those photos go live online? It kind of spoils the surprise party for these car makers. But now uh, in China, they've uploaded some photos on to the official website, not the uh, mini websites, but the Chinese regulator websites, which shows off the new mini Aceman. And this in China is going to be an all electric vehicle. It, outside, it will probably be different types of propulsion. Uh, but in China, it'll be a pure EV, a four door layout, uh, small Smaller than the Countryman, if you are familiar with the, uh, the history of, uh, of Mini's lineup. In terms of size, it varies slightly for some reason between the base and the S trims, measuring between 160 inches, that's about 407 centimetres, to 161 inches, and, uh, and width and height as well. This compares to the previous Clubman's um, dimensions of being longer, 168 or 400 inches or 428 um, centimetres. The wheelbase stays the same, though, on any version of this exclusively electric in China. The Aceman uh, will not be hybrid or diesel in, uh, in any other um, configuration. International versions will be made in the UK. Uh, I think this could probably going to be more than electric. I'd like it to just be purely electric, though. Uh, two powertrain options, according to the Chinese ministry. A 40 kilowatt hour battery, 181 one horsepower in that and a 54.2 kilowatt hour battery with 214 horsepower uh, performance estimates under chinese cltc suggest 300 kilometers of range that's 186 miles on the base trim and uh, that's always very very optimistic uh, the top trim 249 miles or 400 kilometers. So we want to see that properly on WLTP and EPA and real world, world conditions as well. But already looking chunky and cool and very mini-ish. Okay, last two or three stories today. This one from Electrek pointing out that New York City plans to establish its largest public EV charging station near JFK Airport. Uh, developer Wildflower has been selected to uh, do this project on a 2.3-acre site between the Nassau Expressway and uh, Rockaway Boulevard. It'll have 65 charging points, 12 of them DC fast charging stations, uh, slated to be completed by 2025. Love this news coming out of the Renault Group over the weekend, and that is remanufactured EV components. Their subsidiary company called The Future is Neutral, which is an interesting name uh, for a company. But anyway, uh, that's their sub subsidiary, which is known as The Future is Neutral. They are now remanufacturing key electric components. So that would be motors, power electronics, batteries even, and customers can opt for the remanufactured parts that are 30% less expensive than the brand new OEM parts available for cars like various versions of the Zoe, Twingo, Kangoo, uh, the Master, and others as well. The Megan E-Tech, the manufacturing, the remanufacturing is in Flynn in France, uh, set to achieve around 3,000 reconditioned components every single year and just love stuff like this call it the circular economy or whatever you will but just the the maturation 
of the EV market. I can't tell you after over 2,000 of these podcasts every single day, starting in 2018, where we were hunting around for news someday and just any bit of positive good news coming out uh, could have filled an entire podcast. And now we are getting to the stage where we're talking about, you know, quarter of a million Maybachs. And um, that's, that, that, that's a real edge case. Inductive charging on Cybertrucks, that's an edge case. Remanufacturing components, that's a, another little piece of the puzzle. All of this stuff was very, very optional, <laughs> you know, five or six years ago. Let's just get the cars on the road and talking about EVs. And now we're adding all of these things in that combustion world has already, the huge industry that is the combustion uh, automotive world, and it's all going EV. And we're all putting these bits of the puzzle together. And I absolutely love stories like this. It makes me so excited and optimistic for the future as well. Speaking of optimism, Australia is one of those countries that makes me so optimistic because only well, a short time ago, they were so far behind on the EV adoption curve and yet so far ahead on things like solar. Well, you should be because you've got all of the sunshine. Can we have some, please? Well, now uh, Australia is catching up with the, the choice of cars on sale, still behind you know, many other places. I'm not kidding uh, that it's not you know, uh, the most choice in Australia, uh, but still some cars that others don't get as well. And uh, a lot of Tesla sales. And now we see the expansion of the supercharging network with the northernmost supercharger now going online. It's in Bowen, North Queensland, at the intersection of uh, Soldiers Road and Bowen Connection Road, if you're in the area and you want to find it. It's uh, six stalls. There's six V3s, not the V4s going in there yet. Um, but still, look, it's 250 kilowatt fast charging. One of the stalls at the very end, by the look of it, has been turned around 90 degrees. Not quite a full pull-through spot because it kind of goes onto grass, but I certainly think if you were towing, that would make your life easier. You could back in perhaps to that space or they're just giving you some flexibility uh, there. And this is all part of what's happening in Australia at the moment. This is another one of those sites accessible to non-Tesla uh, third-party vehicles because of the way it's been funded with some public money as well. Um, it's uh, 85 cents per kilowatt hour to use the Tesla app and charge your non-Tesla EV. And finally, another thing that I get really excited about, and that is battery storage integrated with EV charging, whether that is on site in big containers behind the chargers or like this in the case of FreeWire. Now, I've used the FreeWire chargers and they're just brilliant. I've used the ones made by VW Group Components. They make a battery integrated charger as well. And, and this is a great innovation by FreeWire, and they are introducing what they call the Accelerate program. This enables a business, if you're a business, I think to start within the US and you want to host EV charging, but you're worried about the initial investment, they waive that. So the Accelerate program installs the EV charging equipment, these battery integrated chargers. They do the site design, the installation, the operational management, and you get a revenue share generated by the stations. So it's a beneficial partnership for both FreeWire and the site host as well. After five years as a site host, you can take ownership of the charger and transition the revenue to being full revenue control. And uh, apart from that, there's also uh, some other... Uh, incentives to buy and own the charging equipment and keep all the generated revenue, various financing solutions available through FreeWire's partners aimed at reducing the upfront costs as well. And interested businesses can go online uh, to the FreeWire website and say, hey, I'm interested. I want to know more details because I love the idea of batteries and EV charging because the big hurdle, there's so many big hurdles to putting DC fast charging in, uh, getting the land is one of them, uh, but getting the grid connection is the other. And the minute you start doing civil engineering and some civils and you start digging up the road and start to put some, some decent power in, it gets very expensive very, very quickly. So battery integrated EV charging, you can just, it's like filling the bucket very slowly with a drip and you turn up with your EV and you plug in, attach that big old hose pipe to the bucket, drain down the battery, dump the power in, you're on your way in 20 minutes. And then with a small grid connection, I can just start trickle charging that battery again. You avoid peak demand charges and all these things that can really hurt a small business that might want just one or two DC fast chargers in a particularly unique location or something. So I love, love things like this and innovative ways. Financing is going to be the next thing we talk about over the next five years. How do we get charging in different places? How do we get vehicles in the homes of people that can't afford uh, either the upfront cost or leasing? On, and, and this is another example of innovative EV finance and I love, love stuff like this. Well, that's a nice way to start the week. 
wasn't it? Lots of positive news to get us underway and uh, put a smile, hopefully, on your face. Uh, certainly mine. Some brilliant stories today in EV News Daily. Thank you to those over the weekend that uh, tagged me and stuff, forwarded me things on email. If I didn't get through to everything, I get a lot of stuff sent through to hello at evnewsdaily.com. That's my email address. And um, I feature as much as I can, but without making this show two hours long, uh, not everything gets in every day, but I try and save stuff for the weekends, perhaps, sometimes. Um, thank you very much to everyone who supports the show on Patreon, because that is how we are funded. It keeps us independent, means that I don't have anybody telling me what to say and what to include or not. So you do get a completely unbiased view of the world of electric vehicles and everything surrounds it in 20 or 30 minutes a day. And if you find that service useful and you can contribute and get this show on the air, have a look at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash EV News Daily. As always, thanks to our premium partners, Porsche of the Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, and Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, National Car Charging on the US mainland and Aloha Charge in Hawaii, Derek Riley from Nevo.ie and the Nevo EV Review Island YouTube channel, Octopus Electroverse, global public charging made simple with one app and one map, and Lease Plan, Electric Moments, providing all the tools and guidance EV drivers need. Have a good one. See you tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.